afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll give everyone a few minutes to enter the room here. afternoon everyone thanks for joining us we'll give it another one to two minutes to get everyone into the room here afternoon everyone thanks for joining us we're going to give it another probably 30 seconds to get everyone in the room here See the room still filling up here. We'll just give it another 30 seconds. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our now monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is on gene therapy, what's new and what's next. My name is Brett Spitelli and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilic Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will pose to the panel after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Monday, October 5th. I would like to introduce our panelists this afternoon. Dr. Len Valentino is the president and CEO at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Dr. Margaret Ragney, professor of medicine and clinical translational science, Department of Medicine, Hematology, Oncology Division at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Dr. Stephen Pipe, professor of pediatrics and pathology, Lawrence A. Boxer, research professor of pediatrics and communicable disease. Pediatric medical director, hemophilia and coagulation disorders program director, Special Coagulation Laboratory, University of Michigan, Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Mott Children's Hospital in Michigan, and Dr. Glenn Pierce, who is the Medical Vice President at the World Federation of Hemophilia. We thank them for taking the time to join us, and I will now turn it over to Len to get us started. Len? Thank you, Brett, and good afternoon. Uh, good morning to everybody that's on our uh, webinar. First, I'd like to thank our esteemed uh, panel that we have with us today. I hope you're going to enjoy this. Uh, presentation and we'll have ample opportunity hopefully for some questions. So I wanted to start and just go through the evolution of hemophilia treatment and on this slide is one that, uh, that you may have seen before but I think it depicts the different types of products that we've had to treat hemophilia. 
so beginning uh, early on factor replacement therapy, whether that was with a plasma derived or with recombinant products that we currently use, standard half-life products needed to be administered frequently by intravenous injection because of their short uh, duration of action. These products also carry a pr uh, risk for inhibitors and a high cost. The next evolution in hemophilia treatment came with the development of extended half-life factor eight and factor nine products. These could be administered at a slightly less frequent uh, interval, but they still had a relatively short half-life uh, resulting in the need for frequent uh, in intravenous injections. The issues around inhibitors, the cost, et cetera, are essentially similar to the standard factor uh, products. The, the major advancement came with the development of non-factor therapies where these could be administered subcutaneously, eliminating the need for frequent intravenous injections. Uh, these pro the, the product can be administered as infrequently as once per month under the skin. Uh, and these have a, a significantly lower risk for the development of inhibitors uh, and essentially no risk for the development of inhibitors against factor eight. Unfortunately for factor nine, this, these products are not currently available, uh, but they, they also carry with them a, a relatively high cost uh, similar to the factor products. The real advancement may come with the development of gene therapy. Next slide. So there's been a number of advances that have occurred over the last uh, 40 to 50 years that have resulted in uh, gene therapy coming towards us uh, at a very rapid pace in the last several years. These are both clinical science advances as well as clinical science. Beginning with the development of uh, or identification of the vehicles or vectors that can be used to transport um, a cargo gene to uh, a recipient uh, or a target cell really occurred in the early 1980s. And uh, actually people like uh, Dr. Glenn Pierce were at the forefront of many of the advances that were occurring in early gene therapy work uh, as well as uh, Dr. Ragney and Dr. Pipe, who you'll hear from uh, in the next few minutes. But many of these basic science advances involved um, improving the, the vector or gene delivery mechanism, understanding the immune mechanism against these uh, uh, viral uh, particles, and then also, of course, understanding how to optimize or, or maximize the um, effects of the uh, 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 gene that we're trying to deliver to the patients. Next slide. So on this slide, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an understanding of what the potentials are for uh, gene therapy. And you can see not only are we looking at uh, gene therapy, but there's opportunities for other types of therapies, um, including stem cell therapies that are in clinical uh, or preclinical development at this point, as well as the opportunities to deliver genes by using uh, different mechanisms to get these genes into the cells, uh, such as non-viral uh, mechanisms. So I think this is a really exciting time where we're seeing a lot of preclinical development occurring for uh, patients with inherited bleeding disorders and in particular hemophilia. On the next slide, you'll see that there's some important questions that still remain. And that is, um, you know, how high and for how long can we achieve the uh, factor levels that we would like to have? Uh, are these curative and how do we define a cure? And then one of the other important questions that we may not have time to get into is really who's going to pay for this and the cost of these products. So I think that there's, there's some real advantages that, that we're seeing coming forward for us. It's a very exciting time um, and hemophilia patients should be very excited about um, these advances. What I think really we need to now begin to work on is thinking about how we move bleeding disorders uh, or the gene therapy for hemophilia to some potentially other uh, diseases such as our rare bleeding disorders and even von Willebrand disease. We now need to start thinking and stretching our, our scientific uh, uh, muscles to, uh, to, to attack these diseases as well. 
So the, the uh, last thing I'd like to mention before I turn it over to our esteemed group of speakers is that the um, National Hemophilia Foundation has undertaken an exercise to envision the future of the inherited bleeding disorders community, a project that we call the Blue Sky Project. And the um, project is, there. there's an executive summary that's posted on our website. And I would invite all of you to comment on the executive summary. Please provide your input. Uh, it can take uh, um, anywhere from 10 minutes to maybe 40 or 45 minutes, depending on how much you'd like to uh, include in your comments. But please take an opportunity to uh, participate. We really want to hear from everybody in our community. So it's patients and caregivers and um, our industry partners and academicians. So everybody, please participate. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Brett. Thank you. Dr. Ragney, go right ahead. Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon or uh, evening or morning. Um, I'm delighted to talk with you about hemophilia B gene therapy, but I thought it might be really important to start just with a simple slide. Um, many are calling this the golden age of hemophilia treatment, and I suspect that is true. Here what we're seeing is what gene therapy, how it's really done. So you take a gene of interest, that's really a piece of DNA, and it could be factor eight or nine, or really any gene, and it's packaged inside of a viral vector. So what that means is a virus such as AAV, which does not cause disease in man, is cleaned of all of its viral machinery, and the gene is packaged in that viral vector. It is injected by IV infusion into a patient, be it woman or man, with the defect. And then it is targets a cell. And in this case, it's going to target the hepatocyte, the liver cell. And then it commandeers the uh, nuclear, uh, the nucleus of that cell to uh, synthesize uh, express and secrete the protein of interest. So next slide. So currently, great. So currently there are uh, at least two and probably a third related uh, gene therapy trial that are uh, in current progress. Um, as you can see, they have very uh, long names, but whenever you see the ANACO within the name, it really means factor nine. But as you can see, there is an AAV5 serotype. So there are many serotypes and very many have been looked at. And the factor nine Padua gene, which is a very interesting gene in the sense that it has four to 40 fold the potency of standard factor nine. It was derived from a family in Italy where thrombosis occurred. And this gene has really enabled us to use lower doses of vector. And these are all approved through uh, national clinicaltrials.gov with an NCT number. And many of them are in phase one, two trials. So on the next three slides, what I'm hoping to do I guess I have control, good, um, is talk about two things. On the left, we will be seeing factor levels, and in this case, factor nine levels over time of a clinical trial. And on the right, we're going to actually see bleed rate, which we call ABR or annualized bleed rate reduction. Currently, these are the two ways we have to analyze how patients are doing. We'll talk about a few more in a few minutes. But on these three slides, I am going to talk just a little bit about what so far has been found. So in this particular study sponsored by Unicure, but it uses the AAV5 vector and the Padua factor nine gene, you can see that factor nine levels over the course of study of 26 weeks reach 33 to 57% levels, which is pretty impressive considering these patients started out at 2% or below. And on the right, you can see that there were a marked reduction in annualized bleeds, specifically anywhere from 48 to 70% bleed reduction 
whether it was looking at total bleeds, spontaneous bleeds, or uh, any variation thereof. So um, these patients did have some neutralizing antibodies, but they really had no uh, response that made the factor IX level disappear or be reduced. On the next slide, Another study with Pfizer, Spark, who sponsored it. And here you can see that the steady state factor IX levels were approximately 14 to 76%, depending on the vector dose. And you can see that not only is the annualized bleed rate reduced by 94% on the top right, but on the bottom right, you can see that factor use was reduced by 99%. So these are significant findings. And on the next slide, we can see um, another study in which they were, this is a phase 1-2A study with some long-term follow-up, actually as long as four years. And you can see that the mean factor IX levels varied from 21 to 26 and a half percent, and the annualized bleed rate ranged from zero to 0 0.8. So what we're really seeing is that annualized bleed rate and levels appear to be stable over four years. On the next slide, Overall, how long do these gene, ex, the gene expression for factor IX last? Well, we know that Nathwani and George have shown 10 years in that first study, three years in the second study, and the most recent data are now for four years. So that's very promising. But it does bring up a number of questions, as we'll see on the next slide. So, some of the issues that patients need to think about when we're talking about gene therapy trials are, how are they being conducted? How effective are they? And how are they measuring satisfaction? What are the challenges and why would you or would you not want to participate? And certainly this may affect, be affected by social issues such as your work or your family or your friends or even social activities. How does having gene therapy affect these various things? What about physical issues? If you have impairments in joint function, for example, or mobility or your daily routine, how does gene therapy impact that? What about some of the emotional issues? What are your fears, your concerns, your expectations? Do you worry about feeling ill or cured with these uh, new novel therapies? And finally, what about patient care issues? What do you need to know before you have gene therapy and what support will you need? Many of these questions are not completely answered because as you can see, we're in the early stages. But if I would just look at a few of my patients in my center who've participated on gene therapy trials, a couple of them have said, gee, I feel, it, I feel incredible, this is amazing. Um, it does change one's life. It has the potential to actually make you, I don't know, happy, uh, but maybe free of fears would be more accurate. So, and on the uh, next slide, uh, so what could we say in summary for hemophilia B gene therapy? It may eliminate the need for factor. It may reduce spontaneous bleeding, which could really improve one's quality of life. It may improve quality of life in many ways. Freedom of fear, ability to be in social situations without worrying about having a bleed. It may reduce death in due to bleeding in resource poor settings. If you think about many of the countries that do not have available factor for patients, but there are a number of challenges. What is the durability? What is the ultimate toxicity over time? We need more time to answer that question. When will this be suitable for children who have rapidly dividing cells and may not be eligible for current 
therapies. Uh, and what about inhibitor patients who are not eligible for any trials to this point? I would only point to a couple future approaches, which you're going to hear about a little later in these talks. But their um, immunosuppression may be able to be uh, uh, affected and reduced. And uh, the gene itself may be able to be optimized so that we don't have to worry about losing the factor uh, that we are able to achieve, the factor levels we're able to achieve. And in addition, gene editing may be very uh, helpful in reducing immune response. But really, there are many molecular biologists, scientists, uh, and other translational scientists who are working on these many, many problems. But I think we should stay tuned, and these are really great times to be alive. Next. Thank you. Well, um, I get the opportunity to um, bring you up to date on what's been going on, uh, hemophilia A, uh, gene therapy research. Now, this is a busy slide, but I, I think it uh, bears us taking a few minutes to walk through this. So um, you can see that there's a really a robust clinical trial uh, um, list that's going on. Um, some of these are in very early phases. Most of the ones uh, across the bottom portion of the slide um, either haven't dosed a patient yet or are in very early phases of dosing. Um, uh, we'll talk about the later phase trials because uh, the ones that I've indicated in the arrows are the I want to show you some, some data since they've uh, had enough patients and talk about it. Um, but uh, the general principle that um, uh, Len and Maggie out for her is being in hemophilia A gene therapy as, as well. <clears throat> there are some unique challenges to factor eight in that um, this is a much larger transgene. So this is the package that we're trying to deliver to the liver cell. Um, factor eight um, just barely fits. Um, inside the AAV vector. Um, and in general, factor VIII is a more difficult protein to get the cell to manufacture. And so what you will see is that the doses that are being in these trials are much higher in the factor VIII trials. Um, and the uh, expression um, you know, may also be challenged and, and we'll, we'll show some data in that regard. So a couple of things I wanna to point uh, towards the bottom. Um, you can see, you know, up until this point, we've only talked about AAV, adeno-associated virus, but there is activity going on with some alternative delivery vehicles um, using different viral platforms. Um, lentivirus in particular, there's now um, uh, at least three trials uh, that are listed here that are exploring lentivirus. Um, uh, in most cases, um, the cells that are being transduced come from the bone marrow and they are then transduced in the laboratory. Those cells are characterized and then they're given back to the patient. So um, the patient receives back their own cells after they've been modified. Um, the reason that these uh, that we're excited about, about these platforms is they offer some advantages that AAV can't deliver, including uh, possibly some ability to um, treat different cell types that would allow bypass inhibitors. And there's one that is just uh, launching from the Medical College of Wisconsin. You'll see that trial that's listed as a platelet. And uh, this is trial is now enrolling. Now they are going to enroll initially non-inhibitor patients because they wanna be able to show the efficacy in that group as well. But the, the plan for this trial is to be offered to inhibitor patients. So we could have some more discussion about that uh, maybe uh, towards the end. Um, the, the trials that as they move uh, through phase one and two, you know, they're only enrolling handfuls of patients. Um, the most, uh, uh, most of these trials have enrolled um, less than a dozen patients. Um, and it's hard to really, um, you know, gauge what really the outcome is if we were to then expand that to a larger population of patients. So really we have to take with a grain of salt the observations from the phase one and two. They do give us safety and efficacy data guide 
doses that are then selected for the phase three trials, but it's those phase three trials that are going to give us the most information. And all of these have been structured in, a, in the same fashion in that there is a lead phase. Before you get the gene therapy, you are on a traditional prophylactic regimen that allows us to get the background bleeding rate in patients who are on a, a, a you know, a real world uh, optimized uh, prophylactic regimen. Then they receive their gene therapy dose and then they're followed um, for the uh, post gene therapy period. Um, there's only a, a really uh, one trial that has dosed all of their patients in phase three and um, are uh, now advancing through the follow-up and that's the BMN270 that we'll talk about. Uh, so let's go to the next slide and, and let's walk through some of the data that's available. So this is the BMN270 trial. What we're looking at here is data from the phase one, two trial, because that happened first. We have the longest follow-up data from this trial. This was uh, examined in two doses. So uh, you would think that a higher dose or a higher amount of the viral part delivered, we should expect higher levels of expression. It did show that in the yellow is the lowest, uh, 4E to the 13, and then in the green, 6E to the th This is showing um, a, uh, a particular assay methodology that uh, consistent across all the, the, the subjects. The, the way that this is presented, I uh, have seen before, but in the wide uh, colors, that's where the majority of people's uh, expression occurred. Now, you probably know that the hemophilia range is uh, below 40 to 50 percent, and anything above that is in what we call the normal range. Now, the normal range um, is variable across uh, individuals, um, but um, anywhere up to 150 or even a little bit higher is still within the normal range in the population. So what you can take from this is uh, at the 6013 dose, um, uh, across the bottom is, is the follow-up of the trial in weeks. And you can see that by about week 20 to 24, Four, uh, patients have achieved their, uh, their peak expression. Um, the majority of the individuals there are in the normal range. Uh, but what we've observed over now uh, three and approaching four years of follow-up is uh, there was some decline in the, uh, in the activity levels. We don't have an explanation for that. We can talk about that maybe in the discussion period. Um, and you can see now at the four-year point, um, the majority of individuals uh, are going to be in the mild range. And I'll show you some additional data from this trial on the next slide. So we're still looking at the phase one, two uh, trial data, but this gives us some additional color that I think is worth spending some time. So we're gonna start in the middle. So this is the current factor eight range for the patients, okay? Now uh, the color codings here, the, the green circles indicate those individuals who are uh, in the non-hemophilic range, above 40%. Now there are uh, differences in the way the factor eight can be measured. The readouts in these trials have consistently shown that one type of factor eight assay called the one stage reads a little bit higher. So that's why you have sort of two dots uh, that are green in the one stage column versus only one in, in the chromogenic, which is the alternative assay. The blue squares are those individuals who are solidly in the mild range. They have more than 5%, but, but the less than 40%. The green dime is an individual who's in the moderate, so they have a measure on a factor eight. It's um, only between one to 5%. And then the red is an individual where they can't measure by that assay uh, any remaining uh, factor. What I want you to appreciate, now we're getting patients, so seven across, uh, a six across the bottom in the two dose cohorts that I mentioned to you. But let's concentrate on the highest uh, dose cohort. Um, the baseline is the um, number of infusions per year the patients um, uh, had before they were dosed with their gene therapy. And then with the achieving uh, on a gene therapy, just to the right of the line is 
their factor eight usage after week five of receiving therapy. And you can see that those infusions go almost to zero. Now let's go over to the far right. Again, we base on the number of leads on an annualized basis of patients experience receive their gene therapy. On the other side of the line is their number of bleeds from week five onward after they were expressing uh, factor eight. And you can see that their number of treated bleeds is almost zero. You could say that maybe there's a trend to the individuals who have the lowest expression, that maybe we're seeing just a little bit more bleeding and a little bit more infusions. Uh, but again, these are very small numbers. Next slide. What about the safety issues? Well, um, all trials have adverse events that are, that are collected. Um, the majority of them are non-serious. Um, there were some non-serious transfusion associated reactions. These are mild, if you like, allergy type reactions. Um, uh, there is a uh, frequent occurrence of transient uh, but asymptomatic and mild to moderate elevations in a liver enzyme. You're going to hear about that as you go through. This is an indication, we think, of an immune response to the viral vector. Um, it's treated with a course of corticosteroids, prednisone, which is for a number of, uh, uh, of conditions. Um, the, so far, um, no treatment-related serious adverse events. Um, the, no participants have withdrawn from follow-up on the trial, so they're continuing to be followed. Uh, those that went on to have to receive the corticosteroids, um, there was no clinical consequence from that that has been reported today. Importantly, no thrombotic events, and no participants have developed uh, factor eight inhibitors, even though they're expressing this uh, new protein from their livers. Next slide. Now, you, this was the first uh, trial program that was submitted for review with the FDA. Um, they submitted in late 2019, but I think it's important for under, understand what was actually submitted. We, they did have the long-term data, which I showed you on the phase one, two trial, but they submitted for an accelerated approval based on six months of follow-up data from the phase three on only 16 patients of the plan, the 134 patients that were uh, in the trial. So that was the data that the FDA had to evaluate. Um, they received a what's called a complete response letter back from the FDA, which basically the letter is saying, uh, no, this product is, is not approved. But in the letter, they did request that they wanted to see two-year data on the entire phase three data set from this clinical trial program, which means they wanted two-year follow-up from all 134 patients. Now, originally, the trial was expected to meet the uh, endpoints uh, for one-year data at, in the fourth quarter of 2020. Um, which we're, we're heading into, but um, this request is actually asking for two-year data, which would mean that, that those trial endpoints would finish a year later in fourth quarter of 2021. Next slide. So what about some other activity? So this is um, uh, another factor eight program uh, from uh, SPARC called SPK8011. Um, this is, again, a phase one, two clinical trial in uh, men with hemophilia A. They've had 14 participants, and this was still a dose escalation to find the optimized dose. Most of the subjects received the highest dose, which is the 2 times 10 to the 12th. And in the individual had sustained expression of factor eight, um, similar number um, Dr. Ragney was showing, 91% reduction in annualized bleed rate, 96% reduction in factor eight infusions. And uh, those individuals, uh, those responses have shown stable and durable factor eight expression from two, almost three and a half years of follow-up. Interestingly, two of nine participants, though, at the 2E12 dose actually lost their mission. And it's believed that this was due to an immune response to the vector. And this would be despite intervening with the uh, corticosteroids that I mentioned. One patient had an acute reaction to the infusion, which was manageable. Three subjects have shown the liver enzyme elevations. All of those resolved with steroids, although one patient was admitted to the hospital to get an IV form of the steroids to treat. Next slide. 
This is uh, the third trial I wanted to share with you. Um, uh, this is from uh, uh, Sangamo Therapeutics and, uh, and uh, continuing development under Pfizer. Um, we see a, this is a similar type of data presentation as I showed you for BMN270. The majority of the patients are in those wide uh, bars of the graph. Um, to orient you, um, the 50% uh, would sort of be the, the cutoff where above that we would consider the normal range. And the weeks across the bottom is the follow-up on the trial. Again, patients seem to reach a, a peak expression uh, somewhere between uh, here 10 to uh, uh, maybe 16 weeks. Um, and what I've highlighted here in the background is sort of my layer on of the normal range. And again, we do get the impression that out to a year out from the trial, um, there is a dip in the averages of the patients indicating uh, that maybe we are seeing some decline. We're only going to know that through additional follow-up on a year two, three, and four to see what the trend is here. Next slide. This is the last one. This is a trial that I, I'm also involved in at the University of Michigan. Um, and the color codes here, this is a phase one two, uh, uses a different AV vector than uh, the other trials. Um, this is a this is a uh, AV vector. Um, it's from the same family as the um, uh, the previous uh, one from uh, uh, that Dr. Ragney had shown you. This is the same family as this AAV8 uh, uh, virus, um, but it's it's got a, a slightly different uh, variant. It's called HU37. So this is first in man, and so uh, this study was designed to be careful with, since this was the first uh, use of this type of vector. Um, so this was a dose escalation, and uh, it was done in pairs of patients. So uh, at dose step one, there were uh, two patients in the blue line. Uh, then they did a dose escalation uh, in the green, which gave us um, uh, maybe a little bit higher expression. And then in the pink or purple color, depending on your, uh, your computer, um, are two patients at the uh, third dose cohort. So there does seem to be a, a dose response here. Uh, but what I'm impressed with, again, from this data is now with follow-up beyond a year, those patients, whatever expression they did have, seem to be sustaining that expression over time. And uh, we have at least follow-up through uh, over 16 months with no evidence of loss of expression from this trial. Next slide. So to sum up um, from an adverse event perspective, elevations in liver tra transaminases, this is this biomarker we can measure in the blood, seems to be the main toxicity that's observed. It's asymptomatic. We wouldn't know about it unless we actually drew labs on the patients. The majority of these events can be managed with corticosteroids, but it doesn't mean that every patient we can salvage their expression because we have seen some cases where there have either been partial or complete loss of the transgene expression. The pathophysiologic mechanism for the liver toxicity, I think, still remains unclear. Um, there is evidence that this is what's called, this is a type of immune response, which is a reaction against the capsid, the coat of the virus, um, and it's inducing what are called cytotoxic T cell responses against the, ve the cells that have been transduced with the vector. But there may be other causes that we uh, haven't uh, fully understood, including stresses on the cell and it's what, what's called an innate immune response, um, uh, which uh, could be triggered by the genetic elements itself. So um, the, this is a, a fruit for additional discussion when we have our, our time at the end, and then we can maybe talk about what strategies are, are going forward to try to address some of these challenges. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Dr. Pierce, it's all you. If you can unmute yourself, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Brett. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I've got the privilege of speaking about what's next, uh, what lies beyond over the next five to 10 years. Uh, and so you've gotten some wonderful reviews from Maggie and Steve uh, and Len on uh, where we are today, um, where we are uh, with regard to products that are commercialized and where we are with regard to gene therapy uh, for clinical trials. Uh, and as you can see, it's not particularly straightforward uh, we are seeing a lot of variability. 
Uh, so some patients are getting low responses, some patients are getting high responses, a few patients are getting no responses, and so that's a problem uh, with regard to AAV. And then the durability that Steve referred to has been seen at this point in the Biomarin studies, but nobody else has gotten out that far. And so we don't know what's going to happen with regard to the other factor eight studies uh, that are being done. We do know that we've got factor nine out to four to 10 years, and it looks pretty good. That, that's a straight line. Uh, those patients are not losing activity. Uh, so factor eight looks like it's a unique animal in that regard. Reliability is the other problem, not knowing what level you'll get. Uh, safety, uh, you've heard a little bit of discussion about liver enzyme elevations. Um, we know that at least one cause of those, as Steve pointed out, is a T cell response, an immune response to the cells that contain the new factor IX or factor VIII gene that can destroy those cells. But that may not be the only response. There may be other things going on, as Steve pointed out. Uh, either inside of the cell or other aspects of immunity, such as our, our basic primitive immune systems that guard against invaders that may be operating here. And so more understanding is needed there. Uh, and then uh, AAV does integrate into the chromosomes. Uh, and to date, that has looked very safe uh, in the hundreds of patients who have been treated in a variety of clinical trials. But it's certainly something that needs to be better understood and quantified. Uh, and as you've heard a little bit about, um, we can't treat patients who have pre-existing AAV antibodies. Many of us encountered AAV in preschool or if we're parents, we got it from our kids um, because it's a prevalent infection. Uh, it, doesn't cause any, it doesn't cause any disease, but we will make antibodies to it and those antibodies can last for decades. Uh, and so if we have antibodies, we are not eligible for taking AAV. Children are another issue. Um, we have no way at this point of being able to treat children. Uh, at some point, um, that will uh, gradually progress downward as it has for other clinical trials in hemophilia. But it's unlikely we'll be able to treat the smallest children, which um, would benefit tremendously from an AAV gene therapy uh, because their livers are turning over so fast, they'll kick, this, they'll kick the gene out and it won't, it won't stay there for a long enough period of time. This needs to be better studied though. Uh, and a lot of our problems would go away if we could repeat dose AAV. Most of the problems would go away if we could just give it, a, give it again so that if we didn't get a great result, we could continue to give it. But we can't do that with AAV. The antibody responses that we make are sky high, um, just as they would be in a major viral infection. And as a result, it means that, um, that those individuals um, are likely to be ineligible from, for most other AAV therapies in the future. Next. Uh, so what's in the queue for clinical trials that could try to deal with some of those questions? Um, well, um, we are looking at uh, both genes and delivery vehicles. And so um, with genes, we're looking at the idea of better transgenes. And so that's occurred, as Maggie described, with Factor IX Padua. Um, it means that we could use less vector to deliver the factor nine and get more of a bang for the buck. Um, we don't quite have that with factor eight, but we've got some, some uh, factor eights that have been mutated. Some of the work that um, Steve was involved in early on in his career, those factor eights uh, have been further modified and may offer some potential for an improved factor eight transgene as well. Um, and then there's gene editing, targeted addition, putting the gene into the cell exactly where you want it to be. Uh, and I'll cover, that, I'll cover that briefly at the end as a future therapy. Uh, and that applies to repairing the gene. So we've got a gene for factor eight or factor nine, it doesn't work. Uh, if it has a simple mutation, uh, that may be correctable. Uh, and companies have gotten started over these last two years uh, that are designed to address exactly that, making that kind of a change. On the delivery vehicle side, we've got lots of research going on. Um, so it seems like everybody and their brothers trying to make a better AAV 
to date, I really haven't seen a whole lot of a whole lot of success in doing that, but it hasn't stopped a number of groups from continuing to see if they can make an AAV that won't be recognized by the immune system, that can escape the antibodies that we've got, that won't cause the inflammation in the liver. Um, but um, all of that, much of that work um, has been uh, preclinical, uh, with some trying to emerge into the clinic. Lentivirus is something that um, that Steve mentioned, that is a virus that will put genes directly into the chromosomes, and so that will give us a permanent gene uh, addition. Uh, if we want to use factor eight or factor nine and use lentivirus, um, we should see a permanent result from that. And as Steve pointed out, there are three trials that are um, moving forward, uh, and there's a fourth one that um, uh, is getting close to um, uh, going into the clinic. Uh, well, we've talked a lot about the viruses and our host response to them. Remember, we're dealing with viruses and our job is to defend ourselves against viruses. That's the whole purpose of what's happened over 500 million years of evolution. Uh, and so we're trying to prevent that from happening and that's part of our challenge. But what if we could use something that was benign and transparent um, and didn't cause a viral kind of a host response? And that would be a lipid nanoparticle. So they're basically little globs of fat uh, that we could put our gene inside and deliver to the liver as, a, uh, as an example and provide for uh, getting that gene into the hepatocyte, the liver cell, uh, to give us an effect. Uh, and I'll mention that technology in a couple moments too. And then the final area is cells. So instead of using viral vectors or lipid droplets to deliver the gene into the body, what if we just delivered the gene with cells? Uh, and that technology is also moving along. Next. Uh, so this is kind of a simplified graph that looks at two deficiencies of AAV and just gives us a general idea of how different groups are trying to counter that. Uh, and so on the y-axis, we see overcoming the neutralizing antibodies so that we could treat more patients. And on the x-axis on the bottom, being able to do repeat dosing. Standard AAV is in the lower left corner. And there are two companies, at least, that are working on trying to make a better capsid, a better envelope for the AAV so that it can escape uh, neutralization by our immune system. Uh, and we'll see how that develops. They've been at it for a number of years and um, uh, are looking to move toward the clinic with, with um, um, vectors that are so-called hypoimmune. They won't induce much of an immune response and they can escape our current immune response to AAV. If we move over to the right-hand side, um, if we look at the far right, uh, there are companies that are looking at how they can do repeat dosing. And what that means is that you really can't have a host immune response at all, any sort of a host response if you want to be able to give it again and again, just as we give factor eight or factor nine again and again. Um, and so there's a series of companies here and I'll highlight uh, two of them, Generation Bio and Chameleon, um, that are looking to um, mask or make invisible the delivery vehicle so that it can be readministered. Next. Uh, and so this is the this is a cell therapy company that's delivering cells. And so we've been trying to deliver cells from other sources into the body for many, many decades. Uh, and if they come from an animal, they're eliminated within a few minutes. Uh, if they come from another human, we need to use potent immunosuppressive drugs, such as in liver or kidney transplant, uh, to prevent our host uh, immune response from killing those cells. Um, and so that's been a problem. Um, but we've also tried to make these cells invisible over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, a major technique has involved the use of alginate, which is basically seaweed. Uh, that's been processed and purified, um, and it can encapsulate cells and make them invisible. The problem is, is that it's not invisible, and our body recognizes it as foreign and mounts a huge attack against it to destroy it. And so there's a group uh, in uh, Boston called Sigalon that has developed a technology to make this capsule invisible. 
Uh, and so it's a proprietary technology. They've published a couple of papers on it. It came out of MIT several years ago. Uh, and so what they've done is that they've taken cells, they've put the factor eight gene into those cells so that it can not, those cells can now secrete factor eight. Uh, and then they've enveloped those cells in a matrix, a little capsule. Uh, and then they place um, um, uh, many, many of these capsules into the peritoneal cavity where they can find a little home, uh, get access to a blood supply and secrete their factor eight. So they've established this in mice, in non-human primates, and they have opened their first site uh, for their phase one, two trial in London, um, I think this month or this last month. And so uh, that looks like a very interesting technology that has made its way into phase one, two. No guarantee that it's going to work, but they've made a major step toward uh, um, getting around some of the obstacles of using a cell therapy. The nice thing about this is that you can inject it again. Uh, and so if it doesn't last or uh, needs, a, needs to be topped off, you can administer more. Next slide. And then another technology that's making its way toward the clinic um, is this non-viral technology, these little lipid droplets uh, that can contain the factor eight, uh, that can contain the factor eight gene. Uh, and what this company did, which is called Generation Bio, um, they did a neat thing. The AAV is a, it's our delivery vehicle of choice to get the gene into the cell, into the nucleus and, and get that gene to make factor eight or factor nine. But the capsid, the envelope, the AAV itself is a problem. We make this huge response to it. So what this group did was to get rid of the capsid, take the guts of what the transgene is inside of the AAV, the factor eight or the factor nine, uh, and put it into a lipid droplet uh, that they have especially designed to home to the liver. Uh, and so they call it CEDNA, which stands for closed end DNA. It allows that DNA to set up a stable uh, DNA inside of the nucleus that can then make RNA, that can then make protein, which is our factor eight or factor nine. Uh, and so they are progressing through preclinical studies uh, and have been at this for probably about two to three years now uh, and making, making significant headway toward the clinic. Again, this is all high risk, uh, no guarantee that it will work, but it sets the stage uh, with both of these technologies that I'm highlighting for non-AAV ways of dealing with the problem. And that's important for us to think about because gene therapy isn't the end. Gene therapy is the means to the end. The end is to cure hemophilia, not to use gene therapy to cure hemophilia. Gene therapy happens to be the vehicle of choice at this point in time to cure hemophilia. But we need to remember that it's simply a tool designed to get us to the goal, and it's not the goal in and of itself. Next slide. Uh, so what about next generation gene therapies? Um, this technology has really only been around for about eight years. The first companies got started in the 2014, 2015 range, uh, and it's called gene editing. You've probably heard about this in the popular press. Uh, and what it is, it means you can go into the chromosomes to the genes themselves and actually edit them, change them. You can add a gene, you can kill a gene inside of the chromosome, uh, or you can replace a gene or repair a gene. Uh, and so it sounds a little bit science fiction, um, and it is a little science fiction. It's been a challenge to do this in a reproducible and reliable way and to not wind up having off-target events in other chromosomes and other genes. But a lot of progress has been made uh, with a lot of different groups working on it. This is a very hot area of biotech these days. What, what impact this will have for hemophilia, I'm not entirely sure yet. We have two companies that are pursuing, pursuing this for hemophilia that have publicly stated they're pursuing it. One is Logic Bio in Cambridge, uh, and they um, are not in hemophilia yet, but they've just entered their first trial um, with a, an enzyme deficiency, a rare enzyme deficiency, where they are popping the, the corrected gene into L, the albumin gene. 
Uh, and that's a very safe harbor. It's called a safe harbor. You know you're putting it into one place. It's going to be a safe place for you to place that gene. Uh, and they're looking to get expression then off the albumin promoter, the, the part of the albumin gene that makes albumin production, uh, to see if they can get their gene expressed by that promoter. Uh, and so we'll see how that develops. They have factor nine on their list of things to do. And then the other company that I wanted to mention is called Intellia Therapeutics, and they're also in Cambridge. Just about all of this is in Cambridge. Uh, and Intellia Therapeutics is doing gene editing um, uh, using their, their technologies to see if they can change the factor eight gene and put it into, uh, into chromosomes. Uh, and so there's in preclinical studies at this point, uh, no guarantee that we will see them get into the clinic, but that's where they're moving toward. And it remains a, I think, a very promising area. Somewhere down the line, we will, all gene therapy will be gene editing. We won't be randomly placing genes inside a nuclei or inside of chromosomes. We'll be doing gene editing. When that happens, maybe many years away, but these companies form the first group that are really working toward this kind of a goal for much improved gene therapy. Next slide. Uh, and so can these new technologies help us? Uh, and the answer is a qualified yes. Um, they can help resolve some of the unresolved AAV issues. Uh, some of them will offer durability because they offer us permanent changes, uh, not temporary changes. Others will allow more reliability or deal with the variability because they can be dosed again and again to be able to uh, precisely get, more precisely get to exactly what level of factor eight or factor nine one would want. They all are gonna have their host or their attendant safety issues that will need to be understood and resolved. Uh, and they will also be open to individuals that have pre-existing AAV antibodies, it won't matter because these technologies, many of these technologies don't use AAV. They'll also be open with appropriate safety guard, um, uh, rails uh, to children. Uh, there is not a reason why they can't be used in children uh, uh, as opposed to the issue with AAV that I've mentioned. Uh, and then as I said, they are eligible for repeat dosing uh, in many cases. Next. So where are we? Well, generation one AAV, as you've heard from my two colleagues, there it's in clinical trials. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing some remarkable effects. Uh, and at least some of these therapies that are in uh, phase three clinical trials are likely to be approved by regulatory authorities over the next two to four years. So we are at the cusp of a change in the treatment paradigm for hemophilia. We also have in parallel, AAV alternatives that are either moving toward or are actually starting in clinical trials. And they will represent, if they are successful, other alternative gene therapy approaches. Uh, for AAV, the third bullet, um, we will see continued improvements. We need to understand much more about the biology of AAV going into the body. What does it do? How does it do it? Uh, what are some of the things that we can change that might make it less variable? more durable, more reliable. Um, all of that work still needs to be done and it hasn't been uh, really addressed in any sort of comprehensive way. But that will be important if we want to use AAV as a mainstay for gene therapy, not only for hemophilia, but for a variety of other diseases as well. So we do need to catch up to the clinical trial development with much more understanding of the nuances of how this virus comes into the body and how we attempt to resist it. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Pearson, all of our panelists. We do have some questions that came in and um, we'll get right into them here. Um, first one for the panel is uh, factor eight, factor nine expression, annual, annualized bleed rate and factor eight factor nine consumption all serve as outcome measures for gene therapy studies. In some studies, one of these outcomes, um, example factor expression, has not been robust, while other outcomes, example annual, annualized bleed rates, have looked strong. How do we interpret this? Can we feel confident when some outcomes don't do as well as others? Are one of these three outcomes more important than others? 
You know, I, I would be happy to at least start uh, um, uh, on this question. And, you know, it's really an ongoing question. What is the best way to measure outcome? Certainly the most immediate is bleeding, uh, and which, which directly affects quality of life. But are there better markers? Um, we're actually doing a study to look at outcomes in liver transplant patients and how they do using a quality of life uh, uh, measure that's been used in, in cancer patients because it's not just that you're not having bleeds, but you just sort of lose the fear of living with the possibility of, of a bleed at all times. I mean, I think this is very interesting uh, a question and I'm not sure that we have the answers, but clearly, those are the most immediate things and the things we know how to measure. I think with time and as we see more outcomes, we'll be able to answer that. I think with these qualities of life measures that we're doing, uh, we will learn a lot more. So I think it's, there's a lot more to it, but certainly safety and immediate efficacy with bleeding are our best markers. I don't think I'm, I'm surprised at all that we're having very strong uh, annualized bleed rate data and significant reductions in factor eight infusions and uh, factor eight utilization with what might appear to be fairly modest uh, sustained expression in some individuals. I think we always knew that. In fact, uh, Glenn and Maggie will remember there was a day when we thought the targets for gene therapy were in the single digits. Uh, that if we could get even 5%, then, you know, that would be a tremendous achievement. Um, so we know that the clinical effect from a very small amount of factor eight and factor nine is, is pretty significant. However, I think we've seen what is possible in expression and to get the types of quality of life outcomes that uh, Maggie is suggesting, we do think uh, the, the higher levels are what are really going to get us there. And uh, the other thing to talk about is the, because I think one of the questions here deals with the ethics of, of gene therapy. Um, you know, what outcome do we need to demand to embrace some of the ones of the side effects from this treatment, particularly over the long term? And it may be that um, being satisfied with just single digit expression is just not good enough um, to, to uh, counterbalance the, uh, some of the risks. You know, another way to look at it is that gene therapy over these past 10 years has not been developed in a vacuum. Uh, this field has progressed. Uh, and we, you know, we now have emicizumab, we may have BIV-001, we have extended half-life factor IX. All of those things have, have incrementally addressed the problem of low trough levels, of bleeding um, with compliance issues. Uh, in hemophilia. And so the bar has been raised. And if gene therapy doesn't raise its bar too, then how do you distinguish it from the, from the therapies that are moving that bar higher? Great. Um, thank you guys so much. Next question is, can you please comment on the potential for pediatric trials in hemophilia gene therapy? Are there ethical issues in asking pediatric patients to provide consent or asking parents to provide consent on behalf of their child to participate in such studies? This seems like a different situation from enrolling pediatric subjects in a factor replacement clinical study. Yeah, well, that's a great question. I, I, I think there's, there's two core issues here. Um, there is a, a practical um, scientific issue with this AAV uh, mediated liver directed therapy, but then there are also uh, ethical issues. Um, on the very practical side, remember we're targeting the liver. We only have one opportunity to get the gene into the cells and the vast majority of the sustained transfer of genes exist outside of the chromosomes. And because of that, when those cells divide, um, it, they only divide the chromosomes. They will not multiply the, um, the transgene material that's there behind, that's, that's in the cell. So over time with m many, many cell divisions, um, you will potentially dilute out the transgene and expression will fall. And this has been a, a major hurdle that we haven't been able to address with um, this 
type of AAV therapy, and it's why it's not being offered to very young children. I think what I could say is, as even as a pediatrician, I believe this platform could have some application in adolescence, uh, maybe 17, 16 year olds, perhaps even all the way down to 12 year olds, because the liver is pretty close to adult size as you get there. But the ethical issue is one that I continue to struggle with. Um, we do have an assent. So uh, even though a parent is signing the uh, consent form, um, uh, we still have have an age of consent ascent where the patient truly understands what they're getting into. I think, I think it's challenging to understand all of the risks and benefits of gene therapy for a fully informed adult. And uh, whether a younger child can really embrace that, I think is really challenging. And because of that, I, I, I just can't really get behind pushing pediatric application in the current form of gene therapy that we're doing in hemophilia today. Great. Thanks, Dr. Pipe. I'm going to try to get to all these. I know we're running a little bit over, but it seems like our audience has still stayed strong there. So if our panelists don't mind, we'll continue with some of the questions. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Lawrence, who's joining us from the UK. It's great to see you too, Lawrence. Thank you. Um, considering some of the existing knowledge gaps, Please, can the panel describe the current process of patient consent in the gene therapy trials to date? Does this process vary depending on gene therapy trial? Also importantly, are there any form of validated knowledge assessments used to ensure participant is fully informed about what, are, what they are signing up for? Does the panel consider each approach if and when the first generation of gene therapies are commercialized hemophilia? You know, I might just start. Uh, I think that's a very, very critical question, and I appreciate the thought that's gone into it. Um, I would have to say when I do a consent with a patient for any trial, I try to make sure that it's as straightforward and I draw pictures. Actually, I was at the recombinant advisory committee, and I think I freaked them out when they said, well, Dr. Ragney, that's all in good, but how do you really know that your patient knows, understands what you're saying? And I told them, I draw pictures, and I think <laughs> they were uh, sort of shocked. But the truth be known, we can make these things rather straightforward and simple. And as you do that, patients will ask the questions they have. Is it complete? Is it thorough? I think it's as complete and thorough as the information we have. So, you know, I think um, both Glenn and Steve and I have alluded to the fact that there's a lot we don't know. We actually do not know exactly what happens inside the hepatocyte or why it would be that even at high doses, some of the factor eight levels keep waning. And, and there have been a number of very interesting studies that have looked at what that large factor eight does inside the cell. And uh, Randy Kaufman and some of his colleagues wrote a paper about this a few months ago in Blood, the journal. And basically, it seems like it may be a very uh, globular protein that may, quote, muck up the works and make it hard to express uh, the factor eight that's given. Um, bottom line, I start out with pictures. I try to make sure that safety and what the issues in terms of side effects is. I try to make sure that they know how much they might expect in efficacy and where we have some limitations. Um, it's, it's a big issue. And at this point in time, I think there are a lot of unknowns. And I think we have to be very honest. And as more is known, we make that available. But I think we are really in a steep learning phase that continues. Yeah, one, one good thing, I, and I appreciate about this community, is because we've had uh, good therapies for a long time, we spend a lot of time talking about new waves of therapies before they ever come to be a reality, including even clinical trials. So we've been talking about gene therapy for 20 years. Um, so this, this patient community is far more informed than other communities where, where they're dealing with a life-threatening um, uh, condition, no prior therapies, and then suddenly a new technology arrives and they're being asked to consider that new technology. 
So uh, I, I draw pictures too, Maggie. I, I find it very useful. But I also find that the patients who I've had who are interested in gene therapy came very well informed already. And I was just sort of rounding out to make sure that we covered all the important aspects. Great. Um, next question. Um, what, outcomes, what outcome measures is the FDA looking for specifically in order to approve? Will they also consider various outcomes in addition to the, the durability? Well, maybe I could start with that. Um, so the, the, uh, I believe the co-outcome measures that, that Biomarin had submitted were, um, were factor level and annualized bleeding rate. Uh, and so we really only have three outcome measures that, that have provided us with any sort of quantitative numbers. One is the factor level. Second is that annualized bleeding rate that Steve went into some detail about. And then the third is factor consumption. How much factor eight were they using versus how much factor eight are they using afterward or factor nine? Um, and so those are, those, are powerful, those are powerful measures, but, but the, the factor um, consumption and the annualized bleeding rate, as Steve was saying, they're not sensitive. They're not, uh, you can have the same number whether you have a 5% factor level or a 150% factor level. That number won't change. And that's because you can, you, you don't bleed 24 hours a day, 24 um, seven. You know, I can remember going two weeks, three weeks at a time with 0% factor eight, not bleeding. So it's not like you automatically bleed when you don't have a high enough factor level. And that's why those are, those are cruder measurements. They don't tell us truly what the, what the incremental continuous effect of higher factor levels can, can do for you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Um, do you have thoughts on the role of genetic counselors in the administration of these kinds of therapies and treatment? Well, you know, a genetic counselor can counsel a patient and the patient's family on what the genetic defect is, especially if genotyping has been done, so that they could potentially see where the defect was. And actually, if we think a little more in a future sort of way, as, as Glenn has pointed out, it might be very important as new approaches to gene therapy are developed that we actually understood what our specific defect was in factor eight or factor nine and what actually could be done if and when these are gene specific or gene mutation specific. Um, but I do think understanding what hemophilia is and understanding what your particular defect is helps to understand a little bit better what this is all about. I do think that we'll have greater meaning as we have more specific therapies that are not just dumping a gene into the liver, uh, but rather perhaps gene editing as, as Glenn uh, po uh, pointed out. Great, thanks Dr. Ragney. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, Brett, I was just gonna offer, cause I, I saw a question from the chat here, which I think is important for the group um, uh, to address. So. Um, this was uh, related to the AMT 061 data that uh, Maggie showed. Um, the, the slide um, may have indicated that the chromogenic assay underestimates the factor, eight, factor nine activity by 40%. Um, we don't want to make the assumption that the one stage activity is the true activity and the chromogenic is not. In fact, across all of the trials, this difference between the two assays has existed um, for factor eight and factor nine, we actually do not know which one correlates best with the, if you like, the in vivo or in the body um, a clottability of the patient. So that's why we're using both of the assays. Um, uh, so I, I think this is a really interesting issue going forward. And it, I would say it's uh, unresolved as it is. Um, the other thing, Maggie, just related to your slide, just in case, because you didn't have as much time to go through all the details there. Uh, you were showing some data from the 060 trial, which um, uh, was the non Padua version, um, where we do have the long-term outcome patients. Those patients are out years with the original vector with the non Padua variant. And in the phase 2B data, 
had on there was the same vector with the uh, with the Padua variant. So we can we can uh, assume uh, that patients are going to have even better clinical outcomes because they're achieving uh, expression that's much much higher from the Padua variant. I, d I just want to take some time to clarify that. Thank you. Um, so another question coming in here. We're still holding well over 100 on the audience, so we'll just keep going here if uh, panelists are okay with that. Um, this one is for Glenn. Um, how would these new therapies, gene editing, et cetera, be utilized in patients with inhibitors? Mm. Uh, ultimately, patients with inhibitors are going to be studied uh, with gene therapy. Uh, if patients have, um, have had an inhibitor and it's gone, um, there really is theoretically no reason why they should not be eligible for gene therapy. Uh, and it should be as effective in them as it would be in anybody else who's never had an inhibitor. So I think we're all anxious to see that move forward uh, in this field. If you actually have an inhibitor now, uh, the, the, the overall question that we want to answer is, if we give gene therapy and get a constant amount of factor eight getting made and getting secreted into the circulation, could that tolerize us the way we give factor every other day to try to tolerize the body and get rid of the inhibitors, the antibodies that are blocking factor eight? And um, in, some, in some experiments with hemophilic dogs, that has been uh, the case. Uh, it makes sense from an immunologic point of view, makes perfect sense. Uh, and it is one of those things that just needs to be tested. It needs to be tested though under rigorous clinical testing uh, procedures to make sure that, that the safety of the patient is kept paramount in doing this. And so I think that as gene therapy progresses, as some of these come to the market, we will, we will see this as a clinical trial uh, designed to test whether or not it could be used as perhaps a more effective way or certainly a more cost-effective way of treating an inhibitor patient. Thanks, Dr. Pierce. Uh, we've got another question in the chat that came from Dr. Karkarni. Dr. Karkarni, I hope you're doing well. Um, do you think that gene therapy can address carrier status in women and correct it? Hey, this is, this is Maggie, and I'd love to at least start with that question. Um, there's just no reason I can think of that women could not also receive gene therapy. And many women are symptomatic. We take care of many women. As you know, for years it was said that women had no bleeding symptoms. And then we've had some really outstanding uh, studies that have clearly shown that women have joint disease, Certainly they have excess bleeding with menstrual bleeding and with uh, postpartum bleeding. Uh, I think that it's quite time that women be part of this entire effort. And I actually think it's part of NHF's mission to assure that all those who are potentially able to receive a gene therapy uh, would have the potential to at least participate in trials and uh, see about how that works for them. So I would be an advocate, a strong advocate for uh, including women in trials. If I could just um, point out, there's a, there's a chat box here that talks about when we could expect to bring gene therapy into the developing world. And that's something that is um, been a passion of mine in working with the World Federation of Hemophilia. The, you know, we're doing a humanitarian aid program. We're treating 20,000 patients a year. Uh, and for those 20,000, we are making a huge difference in their quality of life. But the treatment that we're giving them is not the state-of-the-art treatment that they can get in North America and Europe. It's not, it's not full-blown prophylactic therapy. It's not, um, it's not designed to keep them, keep them as healthy as possible. It is designed to save their lives and prevent some of the major problems that occur with hemophilia. And, and there's really no way in, in our lifetimes uh, or even our children's lifetimes that, that these governments are gonna be able to pay for the kind of factor replacement or non-factor replacement therapies that are required. The volume, the sheer volume that's required, there's not enough manufacturing capacity in the world to make that much protein to begin with. And so gene therapy is the ultimate solution here that we need to be driving toward. And as more and more companies come into the field, as we get 
as we deal with some of these problems of variability and reliability, um, we need to be thinking about how we can transfer this over to the developing world because this would make such a huge difference in their lives. We all agree with that. Thanks, Dr. Pierce. Um, another question, if you guys are still okay sticking around, is the U.S. healthcare system more likely to pay for gene therapy on a one-off payment basis or an annual payment perhaps linked to factor expression or decrease in CFC use? I would say this is unresolved. Um, uh, I, I'm, sh I'm certain that uh, Biomarin, before they received the CRL letter, uh, was already working uh, in back channels on how this was going to be reimbursed. Uh, but since it's now uh, been delayed, um, I don't think any of us have heard any finalization on what the strategy will look like, um, nor uh, is, it, is it certain that it will be reimbursed in the same fashion in all corners, even within the U.S. So what you're suggesting here, one-off payments, annual payments linked to uh, outcomes like factor expression or, or reduced use of clotting factor concentration. I think those are all on the table, um, but not settled. Great, thank you. Dr. Pipe, we have one last question here, and this is something that, that uh, Dr. Valentino and I were going back and forth with a little bit. Um, I understand that one of the vaccines being developed for COVID-19 uses AAV5 to deliver, to deliver the vaccine. What is the implication of this vaccine for someone who has hemophilia who might be interested in receiving gene therapy? Well, be, be careful that we don't mix up AAV with adenovirus. Yeah. Um, there is a vaccine that is using adenovirus serotype 5 to deliver uh, the COVID antigens or the COVID proteins. Um, I don't know if there's one that's using AAV, but if there is, I would avoid it. Mm -hmm. And there will be enough of a choice. If you, if you are interested in the adenoviral vaccine, if that turns out to be a good one, that's no, no issue, no conflict with AAV, completely different viruses. Great. And any other panelists want to chime in on that at all? Totally agree. Absolutely. Great. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, we certainly appreciate you and your time and your expertise. Um, I'd also like to thank um, each and every one of you for joining us tonight and hanging in there on a, on a particularly long uh, webinar, but I think well worth it. Um, please note that uh, this recorded webinar will be available on Monday, October 5th on the, uh, on, on, at hemophilia.org. Um, once again, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. If you do have any questions, um, that we might not have gotten to during this session, you can always send them to genetherapy at hemophilia.org and we will forward them to our panelists and ask them to answer them for us. Again, that's genetherapy at hemophilia.org. Thank you to everyone for joining us and thank you to our panelists once again. Have a great evening and a wonderful weekend. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great fun. Thank you. Bye.